Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's virtual program at the Commonwealth Club. My name is Katie Bell. I'm a nurse consultant with Telewell Indian Health uh, MAT project, and through my work, I mentor and train California tribal clinics as they develop medications for addiction treatment programs. I'm very pleased to be the moderator for this program, which will address both trauma and resiliency found in communities of color going through the opioid crisis. With us today are Dr. Patrice Harris, Virginia Hedrick, Dr. Andrew Herring, and Marlise Perez, all of whom are fighting the opioid crisis in communities of color through their work. This program is supported by Bay Area Community Health. If you are watching along with us and have a question you'd like me to ask any member of the panel or the panel at large, please put it in the text chat on YouTube and include who it is meant for. I'll be asking questions from the audience later in the program. While much of the social and political attention surrounding the nationwide opioid epidemic has focused on the dramatic increase in overdose deaths among white middle-class suburban and rural users, the impact of the epidemic in communities of colors has received less attention. It is important to recognize and be responsive to historical and ongoing trauma, particularly trauma experienced in health systems and through the criminalization of the war on drugs. This trauma is often perpetuated by the lack of community-based pre prevention, intervention, and access to treatment, especially culturally competent, competent care, as well as the lack of addressing cultural stigma related to seeking treatment in communities of color. Today, we will have an important conversation about these issues it is now my pleasure to introduce our panelists. Dr. Patrice Harris is a psychiatrist and the immediate past president of the American Medical Association. She has led the AMA's efforts to end the opioid epidemic and has been the chair of the AMA Opioid Task Force since its inception in 2014. Dr. Harris continues to lead the task force as it works across every state to eliminate barriers to treatment, provide patients with, ac with access to affordable and non-opioid pain care, and fight the stigma faced by those with substance use disorders. Virginia Hedrick is executive director of the California Consortium of Urban Indian Health, an organization which works to maintain and improve the quality of healthcare services that are offered to urban Indian health programs in California. And Virginia is an enrolled member of the Yurok tribe. Dr. Andrew Herring uh, is a personal hero of mine, uh, is, is an attending emer emergency physician and associate director of research at Highland Hospital Alameda Health System in Oakland. He is a medical director of the hospital's substance use disorder treatment program and attending physician at its interdisciplinary pain medicine program. His current research focuses on emergency department treatment of opiate use disorders and pain management. And our final panelist is Marlise Perez, um, a game changer in my life. Ms. Perez is the chief of the community services division of California's Department of Healthcare Services. Her department helps to increase the treatment resources available to those with an opiate use disorder, including increasing medications for addiction treatment. We will be in conversation for the next 60 minutes with the members of the panel and look forward to hearing their stories and insights. I wanna offer this conversation in the memory of Representative John Lewis, now lying in state in the, at the Capitol building who reminded us to get in the way and make good trouble. Thank you all for joining us. I'm going to start with, um, hi, everybody. Uh, one of my teachers, and I'm going to start with Dr. Harris, and then each panel member can uh, 
give their perspective um, as our opening question. One of my teachers on cultural resiliency, Dr. Iris Pretty Paint, has suggested that when we speak together of trauma and resilience, that we begin with resilience rather than trauma. Today, as we discuss the impact of trauma in communities of color, there is much to consider. Childhood trauma, historical and intergenerational trauma, and racialized trauma. And as we consider the complexities of trauma injuries, we must also consider resiliency, the strength of survival and wellness developed in an individual in family life and the resilience which springs from community, identity, and culture. With historical trauma comes historical and cultural resiliency. Panelists, please speak from your perspective on resiliency in your professional roles as providers of care and as advocates for communities of color. We can be begin with Dr. Harris. Thank you. And I do have just a couple of slides. I'm going to run through them very quickly because I really, uh, really just want to set the stage right and center us for further uh, conversation. But it is my pleasure and honor to be with you today. It is, of course, six o'clock here uh, on the East Coast. And I started out earlier today, this morning, on a panel where we were visioning uh, what the system should look like uh, as we center equity and center mental health um, into our overall systems of care and not looking at systems of care just as far as the health system, but really thinking more broadly and appreciating that every system that we can think of impacts health care. And certainly I am honored to end today with a sharper focus on opioids. So I'll have my team uh, bring up the slides and I'll just go quickly over, um, you know, the work we've been doing at the AMA and how I have and we have at the AMA really um, amplified the focus. Certainly we know that COVID has amplified so many things. And I believe there are three things overall, uh, and these are huge big buckets, lots of things to talk about in each bucket um, that we will need to attend to uh, when we get on the other side of this COVID pandemic. And by the way, uh, none of this is new, uh, but I will say that I am uh, optimistic uh, that we are having these conversations now. And I'm sure those of us on this panel and those who are listening uh, have committed to making sure that um, these issues are addressed. And, and certainly we have seen in the midst of COVID uh, surges in, in overdoses uh, around uh, our country. And we also know that some of the very things that we absolutely need to be doing during COVID uh, certainly serve uh, potentially to increase anxiety, perhaps, of course, be more isolating which could be uh, triggers uh, for substance misuse. Um, and then we hone in on uh, communities of color. Uh, I will say I do prefer that term or really uh, spelling out uh, the, the, uh, the groups, but we know that um, overdose rates are high. Uh, for all uh, racial and ethnic groups, but they have risen, uh, particularly from 2011 to 2016, uh, among Blacks and African Americans. And certainly uh, the supply of illicitly manufactured fentanyl uh, is the reason for many of these overdoses. And certainly we can all list the many barriers uh, to treatment. And, you know, we, uh, there's, a, there's a term that I heard just yesterday that I think I like. You know, we've talked about culturally competent. Uh, I, I like actually culturally congruent, but uh, the key is to talk about it and recognize uh, the importance of culture. And certainly we have to understand trauma, as was mentioned, and I think this just centers on uh, the need to make sure that we continue to talk about adverse childhood experiences and the data about the lasting impacts on trauma or the lasting impacts from trauma uh, and, of course, the particular impact uh, for later uh, substance use disorders, but it's also cardiovascular uh, disease and diabetes and just a lot of issue. Now, I like to also, and I, I really uh, like the way we need to center this, and that's about resilience. Uh, we need to talk about both. 
And that's uh, also an opportunity to talk about the strengths that people uh, bring to the conversation. Uh, certainly there are encouraging signs, but I know everyone who's participating in this webinar knows that we uh, cannot declare victory, but we've seen opioid prescribing decrease, treatment capacity increase, uh, and naloxone prescriptions have increased, but again, uh, we have not uh, and should not declare uh, victory because we know now that um, the driver of overdoses and overdose deaths are illicitly manufactured fentanyl and fentanyl um, analogs. And so we need to be laser focused. This slide just talks about uh, recommendations from the AMA Opioid Task Force to be laser focused on eliminating all and any barriers to treatment and barriers to appropriate evidence-based uh, pain care. Uh, so again, I uh, look forward to the conversation uh, today as we focus on I will say as we focus on overdoses, because another point I'm sure will be made is uh, we see a lot of overdoses now due to methamphetamine and other stimulants. And so I believe that going forward, talking about the future visioning, we need to talk about overdoses in general. You know, as long as we have a brain, there's probably going to be another substance. So what we need to do is focus on a system uh, that is sustainable, uh, that has a prevention focus, that centers equity uh, and um the patients who have been diagnosed with a substance use uh, disorder and really brings in all of the systems that we know uh, our, uh, our um, patients uh, touch. And we finally want to make sure that we are inverting the burden. Our systems are difficult to navigate, and we need to all be committed to, as we say here in Atlanta, invert the burden. We need to make sure the systems of care, access to treatment are available and easily and equitably available. And so that the burden is on us uh, as folks who are involved in the system rather than the folks who need uh, the services. So again, look forward to the rest of the conversation. Beautiful, thank you. Uh, Marlies, would you like to go next? Resiliency, trauma. Definitely. Um, and I think, Katie, what I would just love to say to folks that are listening is um, your piece where um, what is our role? And here at the Department of Healthcare Services, we have really been over the last few years and will continue to take a harder look at what we're doing at the state level, uh, because we do have a fundamental role in ensuring that folks get the treatment services that they need um, best respond to treatment. And um, so me personally, I feel like I have a huge role in that. I feel like we all do. We all have to really look at these issues, especially as we're talking today about substance use disorders, um, around opioids, um, methamphetamines was just brought up, um, stimulant use, but, but really, really look at how we're delivering the care and to ensure that we're not just trying to do one size fits all model because we know that doesn't work. And so I personally feel very responsible to be continually educating myself, um, to be reaching out to different communities of color to learn what system changes we need to implement and then to make either policy decisions or funding decisions based on those needs. So I definitely feel we have a huge role at that um, at the government level, but then we all personally have a role as well. Right, thank you. Virginia, your perspective. Yeah, I, I think when we talk about, well, there's there's so much to unpack here, right? So mm -hmm. first of all, um, there are specific cultural nuances that must be acknowledged when doing any kind of work, particularly in public health education. And when we talk about equity and inclusion, it's also important that we talk about the first people of this country, American Indian Alaska Natives are so often left out of the conversation when we talk about communities of color, our data is not present. And so if we're not present in that, then we're not a part of the discussion on how we address some of those issues. In California, American Indians and Alaska Natives have overdose rates um, three times higher than that of their other racial counterparts. So this is an absolute issue. I think from a cultural perspective, we have to look at what are the cultural supports that exist 
within Indian country? And what are some of the barriers that may also exist? What are some of the nuances about medication assisted treatment that make it difficult for American Indian people to seek that kind of service? What are some of the cultural supports that would uphold that kind of system? What are all of the paths? And how do we talk about recovery? How do we talk about addiction? How do we talk about harm reduction um, from a lens and using language that is familiar um, using language that is not offensive, using language that's from the community. Um, and I have just been so excited and felt so blessed to work with the Department of Health Care Services here in California on developing some of these key messages, images, and not being afraid to talk about what are some of those barriers that this is not just a one size fits all for each person or each community. Um, as you look through California, we have vast number of California tribes, more than 100 tribes in the state, the largest population of American Indians in the entire country lives in this state. Um, so it's not even that just one cultural approach is it you really have to get regionally specific and you have to lay out a bunch of options for an individual. Um, otherwise, our, our work around getting naloxone in communities, our work around getting medication assisted treatment it's not going to make it far unless these are not these aren't messages aren't being carried by trusted messengers. Thank you. Beautiful, Dr. Herring. Yes, it, thank you. I, this is, what I could add, I think, is it just from the it's just for the the perspective that the healthcare system itself has its history with opioid use disorder, other use disorders, is very dark. And it's it's frankly very violent on a on a very daily basis. Um, so what I see is this incredible willingness to tolerate um, to 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 play ball with with a standard that that is so cruel, really. Um, small trivial interactions, denying a prescription to someone in withdrawal, uh, removing children. Uh, you know, watching friends and family go to jail, watching them be murdered in front of you by police. Th these are these are not uncommon experiences. And they, when I began this work, I began from a very traditional standpoint. Is I thought the problem was inside of individuals. And so I'm a doctor. I go to work. I read the books. You know, I figure out the disorder. I find the patient. I fix the patient. And what I discovered was that I became an expert in what was wrong with our whole approach to treatment. And that I basically ended up with most of our time being dedicated to learning how people are now using countermeasures and ingenuity and problem solving to survive on a daily basis and how to learn from those and convey them to other people and provide support along the way. Um, whereas the treatment aspect of it, you know, at its core is, is very simple. Um, but but this web of, of discipline and, you know, this sort of top-down incarceration <laughs> mentality that has perme permeated almost all aspects of our approach, um, I, I see as something that is would be frankly almost unbearable to me. So when I think of resilience, I think of my God, you know, to just to come to the hospital, just to come to the doctor means taking on just being so gracious, <laughs> to be frank, um, and letting so much go by the wayside. Um, it's a it's an inspiration. Thank you. So uh, I have a couple of questions coming in from the audience, but I'm going to continue. Um, the next question is for the physicians, but anyone can answer. Um, I noticed when I was working at the VA in the middle of the Iraq and Afghanistan war years, building a buprenorphine program, that the um, intensity of combat trauma was often matched by quantity of opioid use. And I began to become very curious and my experience is anecdotal, but I, I really have been curious as to, and here's my question. There's a connect the dots regarding the common symptoms of trauma with the relief provided by opioids. First, what are the common symptoms of trauma and why would persons living 
with the symptoms of untreated trauma reach for an opioid? One, uh, Dr. Harris, and then Dr. Herring. So let me let me say one thing, but let me uh, amplify something that Dr. Herring said because I think um, you know it's important for us to be explicit about this. Um, and I hinted at this, but I really want to be explicit about our country's approach. Uh, to substance use disorder, but really around the opioid crisis, because in the 80s, uh, when we were seeing heroin and cocaine in black and brown communities, our country's response was the war on drugs, right? Uh, But in the last decade or so, when we've seen uh, mostly middle class and upper middle class white families being affected by this, it it becomes a public health, an urgent public health threat. And so I think, um, you know, I always make sure we say that because as we, again, address trauma and all of the other issues in communities of color, we have to uh, be explicit in um, starting from where we have perhaps even further traumatized folks, again, right, further traumatized those community by our our nation's response to that. So I think we should always uh, be explicit about that. And then when it comes to trauma, you know, it's very difficult, actually, because uh, there's no one-size-fits-all when it comes to trauma. Some uh, folks, again, acute trauma, but when we are talking about PTSD, uh, some folks will experience symptoms and signs earlier in the course. Some folks, maybe not till 10 decades later, and there's a triggering response. So I think um, what's more important is that we ask the question, you know, what has been your experience? And Dr. Harris, not what's wrong with you, but what has happened to you? Um, I I saw this, the cutest uh, thing on Facebook, a little toddler um, who, of course, doesn't appreciate this, but she had a little stethoscope and she asked her father, she said, what had happened? And I thought that was so telling because she, uh, in, in being a little toddler, but it's critical that we ask the question, what happened to you? Not what's wrong with you? And that we meet communities where uh, they are and we ask them, um, how can we, uh, what do you need from us so that we can be trusted? Uh, you know, because I, I really agree with the point about a trusted messenger. So again, there can be so many symptoms of trauma. I'll just end on this because we could talk forever. But, um, you know, as a child psychiatrist, I started uh, giving lectures on the impact of trauma on brain development. And I have to say about 20 or so years ago, you know, we didn't have a lot of literature and I was thinking, oh, is this voodoo? Or is this real? But certainly we have such a wealth of literature and data right now. And I remember thinking, and people would argue and get into debates, is ADHD overdiagnosed or underdiagnosed? And actually, again, in some communities, it may be overdiagnosed, in others, it may be underdiagnosed. But there was one thing that I was certain of is that PTSD was underdiagnosed, particularly in children of color, and manifest in learning difficulties and behavioral uh, uh, challenges, but again, it's not what's wrong with them. It's what has has happened to them in their uh, environment. So I think that's key: is for us to listen and learn, not expect everyone to fit into a box, uh, but just. And people are using trauma informed care, and we have to make sure that doesn't turn out to be jargon. But that's a topic for another day. But um, we really have to have systems of care and individuals who are working with the community and appreciate uh, from a culturally congruent standpoint about the trauma and then go from there. Thank you. Erin, you have anything you want to add about the yeah, connect sure. the dots? Sure. I mean, in, in a lot of ways, I see that the, the symptoms of trauma or the signs of trauma in, in an individual are basically all the things that would get you kicked out of care. Right. It is. It's. It's just such this irony is mistrust, uh, disobedience, stress intolerance, um, anger. You know the, the 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 very things that become these the criteria for discontinuation of treatment um, are the exact things that that identify someone uh, who is at risk and most vulnerable um, to 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 harm. Yeah. Um- Thank you. It's it's almost as if reaching for relief is part of the impulse to heal. 
uh, and it takes, you know, it takes, uh, takes us on a journey, but the, the whole thinking that, that this is bad rather than this is something that is, that needs healing is the perspective that's going to shift this. Um, I have a question for, um, <clears throat> um, <clears throat> Virginia and Virginia, this is also coming across the, uh, YouTube. So I'm going to combine it. How is traditional culture and community engagement essential to be building resilience as a response to the op opioid epidemic in tribal communities? How are sacred ceremony, traditional song, prayers and dance, learning and speaking one's tribal language and traditional medicines central to recovery and healing for those with opiate use disorder? And the question that came through uh, is how are you reaching the growing urban native population with these issues? Kind of a big question. Yeah. <clears throat> So I think uh, first is a statement that it is essential. The use of uh, traditional cultural medicine ceremonies are absolutely essential to um, r restoring like a place of restoration. When I say a place of restoration, we can't talk about um, you know this opioid crisis in Indian country without acknowledging that this is a symptom of historical trauma. In California, we're just coming on 200 years of contact. And for some people that seems like a long time, but it's really not a long time. So my great grandmother, remembers a time of contact in her village. That's not that many generations from me. I grew up with my grandmother um, who went, who was forced away to boarding school. These are not hundreds and hundreds of year old issues. We're very close to this on the West Coast. And so we have to talk about it in that framework. How far are we from um, the, this sort of colonial genocide or attempt of genocide of Indian people in California? And how is uh, substance abuse, both opioids and other illicit substances and substances prescribed by doctors and the system of medical care that absolutely is wrought with historical traumas. I mean, uh, up into the 50s and 60s, American Indian women were being sterilized without mm -hmm. their consent in federally funded hospitals. So mm -hmm. there is absolutely a tension um, mm -hmm. that is very culturally rooted, that is very historically rooted. And so when we t start to say, how do we heal from this? How do we address it? Number one, these problems weren't born out of our culture, right? Mm -hmm. Like these, these are things that were brought to California. These are mm -hmm. issues that were brought from a Western world into this world that now we're having to deal with. So it really is a combination of um, potentially Western therapies such as behavioral health therapy, um, seeking counseling in connection with these cultural systems that we know heal us as people, looking to our, our creation stories, looking, to, looking back on how did we stay well before contact? How did we resolve conflict before, before contact? And how can we bring that all to 2020 and make decisions that are best for our community? And how do we um, take the whole picture in perspective, you know, as Dr. Herring mentioned earlier, there's so much that leads up to an incident that's not seen in the emergency room. So how do we then open the windows to see what is the whole picture? And how do we meet the moment with compassion? How do we meet it from a cultural perspective? There's so many stereotypes put a, put upon Indian people that, um, we're, that we're seeing being confronted in, you know, the news daily, but, you know, things around being a drunken Indian, things around um, that we see that put these stigmas on Indian people are also seen in the healthcare system. So beginning to undo some of that and being open to what is the role of sweat in recovery? What is the role of talking circles of community share, a shared community experience that is different than a one-on-one -on -one, um, that we might see in a clinician setting? So I think one is just reframing the question to a statement. It is absolutely essential that people have access to culturally rooted and culturally grounded services. And I don't think that this is only true for American Indian communities. I think that there are other communities that also need to take a deep look at what are the cultural frameworks that have mm -hmm. put them in this position. And that's across communities, both communities of color and white communities and wealthy communities and middle-class communities. What is the culture that has given birth to your crisis and how do you begin to dismantle that? And 
where are the cultural resiliencies that we as Indian people are still here? We are a resilient people. We are an answer to prayer. And how do we put those prayers in place now? Beautiful, thank you. Anyone wanna to add to that? Uh, it's a very full-throated response, thank you. Um, I'm gonna to go to uh, the kind of the, the focus that we had just a minute ago about, about the war on drugs and the impact has, is extraordinary. Um, and uh, so Dr. Herring, you commented recently with that one of the root causes of trauma directly impacting our communities of color is the war on drugs started in 1971. Uh, some of us weren't born yet during the, the Nixon administration and sustained through decades of all administrations. This is our reality. The result is mass incarceration and devastated families and communities of color, especially the African-American communities, which were impacted by the cocaine epidemic, uh, which was uh, really one of our uh, disasters in terms of care and response to substance use disorder. So let's start with Dr. Harry. I'd love to hear from uh, Marlies and Dr. Harris and Virginia. Yeah, I'm pretty furious about our current drug policy, the war on drugs. The I'm embarrassed and ashamed at the, the relative silence of physicians and healthcare uh, workers um, in this area. And I hope that changes. We, we have, the, the statistics were staggering, you know, $50 billion in expenditures, 7 million people um, under in incarceration or probation, uh, the disproportionate rates of incarceration, African-Americans being something like six times more likely to be incarcerated. And, and the, that's all from the big picture um, on the day-to-day -day basis. I'm just pissed because it screws up my treatment. You know, I've, I have patients who I work with, large numbers of folks, and, and we have a big team and we work really, really hard because we want to help. And everything about the criminalization of drugs screws it up, right? The, when, when, they're, when they go to jail, when their husband or wife goes to jail, when they are, their parole officer gets in our way, when even in harm reduction, when the when the steady supply of trusted street illicit drug is interrupted by a, an arrest, all of those things um, are are they actually work against healing, against treatment, and and then I I just the 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 money wasted. My God, you know it's you know we need that money. We we need to be able to help people, um, and we can't do this thing where we simultaneously pay for the, the, the rather needless militarization and criminalization of drugs and pay for evidence-based treatment. We just don't have the, the funds to do it. Not to mention that this culture of, of violence that it in, enables, you know, working in the emergency department where I do these things called medical clearance, where people are arrested for a petty drug crime and they come to the United, come into the emergency department for clearance for incarceration. And there you've got multiple police with them. And the whole system is just ramped up. When if you step back, like this is just a substance. You know, they're, they're, it's alcohol, it's tobacco, it's cocaine, it's heroin. These are intoxicants that have been with us for millions of years. Not Sorry, not millions of years, you know, thousands of years. But we have chosen to go down this path that just very clearly is expensive and violent. Thank you. Marlies? Yeah, and I just, um, I agree with everything that Dr. Herring has said and the other panelists. And, and I think what it, it comes down to when you wanna look for solutions is we have to do things differently. Uh, and first, what we all need to do is look at ourselves. And um, having been in this field for about 19 years, I had to really look at my conscious and unconscious bias. Um, and every time I think I've gotten rid of them, more crop up. And um, I just wanna use my relationship with Virginia as an example. Um, we started working together about three or four years ago, maybe longer. I really didn't understand the native community at all. 
I had very little information and, and, and quite honestly, I was just wrong. I had a lot of stigma um, and a lot of misinformation. And um, so it took me to stand up to admit that um, and then to learn new ways. And it took Virginia and other partners to have a lot of patience with me because I was looking at treatment through the lens that, that I saw that, and through my culture. And so I think when we really stop, it really, it starts with us and we have to be honest about that. And that there's a lot of things we don't understand outside of our culture. And we need to, to really take that introspective and then see how do we do things differently? And how do we view things differently? And I think the other really important piece is we have to, for once and for all, this is a disease and we have to treat it like any other disease. And instead what we do is we do this, this penalizing and we do penalizing based on race. And we do all of these things that we don't do with other diseases. And, and quite honestly, it's disgusting. Um, we need to treat this as a health condition and we need to all recognize there's so much stigma that we still have to break through. And until we break through that stigma, we're going to continue to put individuals that have this disease through so much more trauma than they've already experienced. And so there's a lot of work we need to do, but a lot of the work really starts with ourselves. Thank you. Very good. Dr. Harris? Yes, and I want to build on that. Uh, certainly, in addition to that sort of look inward, uh, the other uh, thing we need to do individually is accountability and hold other systems accountable. And clearly, um, we need to start, again, with the healthcare uh, system and look inwardly. Uh, but I also want us to really start to look at norms and policies and procedures and who is in the room developing those policies and procedures and norms. Now we know who's been in the room heretofore, but here I think there's an opportunity to make sure that the people who will be developing the new system again, so this morning I was on webinar and we were visioning a system where we looked really at upstream and 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 midstream and 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 downstream determinants of health and looked at the structures and the norms and the policies and again in addition to looking inward and our own implicit and unconscious biases, we have to hold all the systems accountable. Clearly, as a health system, I belong to a health system, there's an accountability there. But I also need to make it a commitment to holding law enforcement uh, officials uh, accountable, uh, holding policymakers, local, state, and federal policymakers accountable. Um, you know, and we again need to account for the uh, consistent underfunding uh, and under resourcing of health in general, particularly in uh, communities of color. Uh, and then it's even greater when you look at infrastructure for mental health and substance use disorder. And so there's accountability there for even looking at funding there. And, and no, money does not solve all problems. You know, sometimes we say, well, here you are, Dr. Harris coming and asking for money again. And my answer to that is unapologetically yes. Uh, it's necessary. It's not sufficient. We have to do a lot more things, but uh, we do need uh, to account for uh, look, the reason that uh, someone's life expectancy is determined by their zip code. We need to make sure we are collecting the data and targeting interventions uh, to that zip code. And of course, uh, that zip code has different need. One zip code may be under-resourced, underfunded, uh, has a different need uh, that, you know, certainly uh, California and uh, Native American, Air American Indian communities will have a different need than, say, a community that I grew up in in Bluefield, West Virginia, a small town. Uh, and so there are not any one size fits all approaches, uh, you know, and we should not look for check boxes. Uh, yes, we've done that, so check the box. It, it's, it's work. Um, and we need to be willing uh, uh, to do that work. Thank you. Anyone else? We have a question about the um, impact of the pandemic movement. Um, with communities of color disproportionately impacted by the COVID-19 pandemic due to underlying conditions and ongoing health disparities and systemic racism in our healthcare system, 
I would like to name and honor these communities who have endured so much loss in the past four months. The African American community, the many Asian communities and cultures, the Pacific Islander communities, the Latinx communities, and the American Indian Native Alaskan communities. Uh, we have to remember to say their names. Uh, just saying communities of color is not adequate, especially when we are aware of the tremendous impact of the pandemic. Um, and during this pandemic, we are also facing a devastating increase in opioid overdose deaths. The CDC reports a rise in the overdose deaths with a 13% increase over last year. We have lost some hard-won ground, and our hearts are broken. Dr. Herring, how has the response changed to treating opiate use disorder and other substance use disorders for vulnerable patients seeking care in the emergency departments and the bridge programs during the COVID-19 pandemic? Well, the, the COVID-19 uh, has been devastating in terms of it's created a crisis in access for, for treatment. It, it, has cre it has driven people towards isolation um, and lack of treatment and isolation equals harm um, when it comes to drug use. There's no question about it. The, the, the beauty of the emergency department, particularly for opioids, was that it's the closest thing to, a, to an always open door um, that really didn't have many of the traditional hierarchical boundaries between doctors and nurses and patients um, that you would typically see in a clinic. Um, it's very much like you could literally walk off the street and into the clinical space. And we found that that was an incredible tool to engage people um, in a more um, equitable way in that, you know, if people didn't like the way you talked to them, they could just turn around and walk out. Um, and people really liked that. And so we, we saw a tremendous increase in people voluntarily presenting with intent, coming in seeking care. Well, COVID basically turned us you know, all into some kind of nightmarish vision from a science fiction movie with, with tents and masks and, and visors. And so just that front door um, suddenly became m much more intimidating. Simultaneously, the many clinics um, didn't have the resources to quickly provide uh, online access, telehealth, and many of the of our most vulnerable didn't have the the technology at hand to be able to access those resources if were they were there. Worse is just the the uh, the, the, the scandalous um, spread of COVID within incarcerated environments. And when I say incarcerated environments, I mean jails, prisons. I also mean um, um, residential treatment, um, you know, wh where folks are basically kind of confined. You know, it's, it's like the residential treatment or sleeping in a tent. Um, and so COVID has, has really ripped through those places. Um, so it's bad. Uh, it, it's, it's, really, um, it's really hard to see. It's, it's clearly... Uh, dependent on money. You know, if you have money, if you have resources, you can very effectively protect yourself from COVID, um, whether or not you have a use disorder or not. Um, if you don't have money and agency and power, you can't. Um, and, and, and that's just writ large. Thank you. Virginia? Yeah, what I would add is that, you know, I think COVID-19 has been such a um, real time example for so many people to see what we already see in infectious disease, what we yeah. already see in disease burden is who it impacts the most, our communities of color are, are those with a lower socioeconomic status. That's true of COVID-19, diabetes, heart disease, um, preterm birth, sudden infant death syndrome. You can sort of take any of these things, these devastating measures, and you're going to see the same people impacted by them. I think what has been terrible is we knew this and we have watched it yeah. happen. We've right. watched this happen, right? So, um, you know, a mentor of mine shared this with me and I, I can't help but not continue to share it. COVID-19 is not racist. Anyone can get COVID-19. There's nothing right. that makes one person more vulnerable than the next to getting it. We as humans are racist 
and we right. are carrying the virus. We right. are the ones moving it in communities, in and out of communities, and shutting gates and keeping it out of certain areas. Um, and it goes back to what was shared earlier about when did the, when did the war on drugs become a crisis when it went into those gated communities, right? When right. somehow the system broke a little bit and things weren't going as planned. And that's where we're gonna start to see COVID-19 get as we see the curve begin to rise. It will be as it always plays out in the United States. Once it starts to reach the top, then we're gonna have some really huge systematic measures in place when already so many brown and black lives will have already been lost and already laid the foundation for the research of how it spreads. It's um, you know, how strong it is, who gets it, who's vulnerable, will all be on the backs of black and brown communities in the United States. That's where the research is being built. Right. You know, in Virginia, it's it's the same thing for use disorder. I mean, this was a personal kind of crisis moment for me um, in doing doing my research. And I had to dig really deep on a lot of the early seminal literature on how we understand use disorder. And much of it was done on African-American men um, in the South, um, in Lexington and outside in Baltimore. And I knew that the, that the medical complex who were conducting those studies had no authentic investment in improving that community of people. You know, it was, it was to learn. Um, and I was part of that, you know, that exploitative chain. Thank you, Dr. Harris, any, anything or? Yeah, we'll go and we'll go to Marlies. No, I, I think the points uh, have been made. And then, of course, uh, the the challenge will be, um, so now that we know this, uh, you know, uh, again, some new information, for some new information, for others not, I think, how can we build new systems uh, to make sure that, again, as all of us have said, that we are centering equity and centering culture and uh, making sure that we are listening when we go into a uh, community. So I think that uh, that is the challenge for us. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Marlies. Yeah, the only thing I wanna add, add is something like Dr. Harris said about um, when it comes to making policy. I mean, now we have, we already had the opioid epidemic. Now we have COVID on top of it. And we have, you know, to redesign how we do treatment. And, and then we have our communities of color that already didn't have adequate access to care. And that mm -hmm. we've heard of, of not a lot of access to technology. Um, and so, you know, now more than ever, uh, we need to be more innovative. And, and we need to really be looking at the lens like we've been talking about through these different cultures and really getting to what they need. Uh, because the worst thing for an individual with a substance use disorder is isolation. And it, that's exactly what we have now. And so um, this, unfortunately, I feel is only going to get worse as we continue um, with COVID-19 for anybody with uh, behavioral health disease. Um, and so we need to act now and we need to take measures now. This isn't something that, you know, can wait for research three to five years from now. We, mm -hmm. we know the dangers of this disease. Um, and so we all need to be really looking systematically about what our role is um, in getting some of the solutions out there. Mm -hmm. and, and I will say we do have some learnings and, and we do have some um, action. Of course, we uh, need to, in my opinion, just like everything that we are changing or doing in this time of COVID, not have a knee-jerk response to uh, the intervention, but make sure we have a thoughtful and evidence-based conversation. But I think we should... Um, you know, state that, um, you know, SAMHSA, uh, SAMHSA and the DEA did relax uh, some uh, regulations around uh, take-home methadone and, you know, whether or not you could initiate a visit using telehealth for buprenorphine. And certain states used to have regulations around one-to-one -one needle exchange for harm reduction. So I do think that we should definitely note that uh, there are some folks who, you know, had um, 
had an eye towards solving the problems in the moment and making some changes. It certainly uh, has not been universal, right? But hopefully we can learn from some of those states and continue to uh, build upon a few uh, a few glimmers of hope. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and just to, to right. say really quick what Dr. Harris was saying, um, there has been a lot of great flexibilities at the federal level and state level, which has been fantastic. And let's keep them coming, even after COVID. Let's, you know, break through. Um, why did we have some of those things in place? Were they needed? Let's, let's really use those evidence-based practices um, that you're talking about, Dr. Harris, and, and really make sure that we then don't go and put these measures back in place that maybe are reinforcing stigma or are keeping people out of treatment. Um, So I've seen some of these innovations working here in California, which has been phenomenal. And so we need to lobby to keep that even after COVID. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. ahead. I just, uh, you know, I've been a a boots on the ground clinic uh, addictions nurse and have directly experienced how every single patient requires a patchwork of care. Mm-hmm. There, you can't just say the system is broken when when you have a patient in your office. You have to put those pieces together, no matter what. And I just want to say that the innovation has come out of Marlisa's team, and and Andrew's team is was a huge game changer for my patients. They got care in mm-hmm. new ways. Um, but the patchworking is still there and it's driven by all the disparities, all the misunderstanding, you know, all the internalized stigma, uh, you know, and something I call stigma injury where somebody actually has endured so much wounding because the system hurts them. Um, so I, I see, you know, the amplification of all of our struggles because of COVID but we are figuring out how to keep responding. We just have to not get comfortable. Mm-hmm. Um, I have a good question uh, from the audience. Uh, there's one about the, what role do pharmaceutical companies play in opioid use? And that's a whole two day meeting. But the one that I like here is to what degree is trauma caused by socioeconomic factors versus chemical imbalances? I think that's a good question. Anybody want to start with that? Maybe I'll just jump in, not to answer that, just say some things that I've learned. And and one is that I I think you can see that it's easy to scapegoat a use disorder um, for an entire community's difficulties. Um, And there is a common sort of mythology around um, use disorders destroying communities where what what we can see with some therapies, for example, there are these long acting versions of care that provide a 30 day treatment. It's an injectable um, for a use disorder. And not in everyone, but in some people, the clinical disorder is for all intensive purposes cured. They, it doesn't require compliance. Uh, you don't have to take a pill daily. It's you really kind of take care of it for that for that period of time, not forever, just that period of time. Well, but what what you see is while the disorder is cured, they still end up um, going back to jail. They still have their car towed. They still can't get their kids to school. They still have. Um, they still have mental health disorders and they still are suffering from, you know, interpersonal violence. They still, you know, have a no place to sleep. So all of these other um, issues to do with race and poverty and power are still there. You know, they they don't go anywhere. Um, And that's what frustrates me so much is that at some level, if you really just go after this by reduction approach, which I love. I'm, I'm a doctor. I love bioreductionism. You can fix these some of these disorders, but but that's just a tiny piece of this larger puzzle. 
And, and I would say, you know, that's no different than diabetes, right? right. Um, because if someone has type 2 uh, diabetes, uh, certainly they may be on a medication as appropriate, um, but they also need uh, may need opportunities to um, have the diet that is recommended by the physician and the nutritionist, right? But if you live in a food desert, right, and, exactly. and um, really in order to gain access to some of the things that may be recommended, it's a four-hour trip uh, using public transportation. So, you know, I think uh, we should understand uh, substance use disorders in the way we understand, you know, a lot of other uh, disorders. There's a biological component to it, a psychological component to it, a social, and that includes the social and structural uh, determinants of health. And I would uh, just, in a, as a general rule, uh, and I tell this when I give commencement addresses to our young folks, if someone comes to you and is insistent upon an either or argument, run the other way. You know, mm -hmm. refuse to engage, just run right. the other way because, first of all, it's a waste of your time. And it really is, let's look at all of these issues in context. And so we certainly want to understand the biology. Thank goodness we do. We didn't, not probably even 20 or 30 years ago, but we also have to understand all of the other issues. But also, that's not unlike, you know, other uh, diseases uh, that exist. So I, the only, I just have to add this as, as indigenous people, we have long understood that all things are connected, mind, body, spirit, and the environment, right? So all of these things are connected to our wellness and uh, the Western world is getting caught up, right? Like we have to have studies that prove that uh, sage has medicinal properties. When Indian people have been saying this since beginning of time. And when we see our lands being desecrated, our sacred sites, uh, pipelines, uh, you know, these kinds of things, it's all very, very connected. And we can't continue to behave to in one direction and think it's never going to have an effect on the other thing. So when we talk about income, when we talk about education, of course, it's a, it's a wheel and it's going to spin other things. Of course, it, it's just, it is always so frustrating that we have to wait um, to convince other people by showing, wait, this is how it works when um, it's very much rooted in who we are as people that it's all connected. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, we are almost out of time and I have to do the pitch. Uh, Marlise is going to join me. This is a uh, opioid overdose reversal <laughs> system. Uh, it's available through the California Naloxone Distribution Project. So easy to get if you have a church, if you have a gym, if you have a community, if you have a clinic. A we ER. need, need we're, <laughs> an ER. We're, our goal is uh, uh, Narcan in every pocket. This is easy to use. Um, I'm going to encourage anyone, if you need some, Please find me through Commonwealth. I'll help you get it. Um, we have had an increase of, uh, of lost lives, and so we have to fight back harder. Um, I think we're down to two minutes. Thank you each for your really beautiful, thoughtful contributions. And, uh, yeah, thank you for the impact that you have on, on uh, people who really are suffering. Andrew, you want to show us your T-shirt just for a second? <laughs> That's right. uh, it really speaks to the heart of this panel. Nice people take drugs. Um, so um, I think that's all we have. And thank you all. See you next time. Thank you. Thank you Dr. Harris. Thank you, Virginia. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you everyone. Thank you, Katie. Thank you. Hi, I'm Dan Ashley, the evening news anchor for ABC 7 News in San Francisco, and I hope you and your loved ones are staying safe, healthy, and comfortable during these very challenging times. I am also a proud board member of the Commonwealth Club, one of our most important Bay Area institutions. The club has been hosting wonderful events with exciting speakers and topics in the Bay Area for over a century. In times of crisis, good information and strong connections in our community are especially important. And during the current COVID-19 crisis, the club has really stepped up. Since March 6th, the club has brought you over 100 live-streamed events with speakers and panelists, 
including past governors, secretaries of state, the chairman of the House Intelligence Committee, mayors, county supervisors, respected medical experts, the president of the University of California, experts on anxiety and happiness in times of stress, and many, many more. Every program includes a live chat, so you and viewers all over the Bay Area and beyond have been able to ask these experts the questions that are on your minds. Every program has been neutral and unbiased in true Commonwealth Club style to get to the bottom of the issues that are so drastically affecting our lives. The club has done all this public service despite being profoundly affected by the crisis. The inability to hold events for the past two months has forced the club to cut its budget and staffing by 50 percent. The remaining staff are working from home to bring the community these valuable and informative live streamed programs. The club needs your support to continue its shelter at home programming. Please make a tax deductible donation to the club now by texting the word donate to 329-4231. That is donate to 329-4231 or visit the Commonwealth Club website, commonwealthclub.org. We need the club to be here in the months and years ahead to help inform and educate as we figure out how to get our society and our economy safely moving again. Consider changes to the way we live and work as a result of this crisis and take steps to prevent a future pandemic. Once again, please support the Commonwealth Club now by texting the word donate to 329-4231. That is donate to 329-4231 or visit the website commonwealthclub.org. I want to personally thank you for supporting one of our community's truly great organizations. I'll see you on ABC 7 News and at the Commonwealth Club. Stay safe.